Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. Could May 18th happen after all? The automakers and the UAW take another step in gearing up to start production. It's called a pulse ox, and some people are telling others they need to get one to fight coronavirus. We're putting that claim to the test. And families with loved ones are reaching out, trying to get answers about conditions inside nursing homes. They're finding it is not easy. Good to have you with us for Local 4 News at 6 tonight as we continue to cover all of the angles of the coronavirus pandemic. Yeah, the numbers in Michigan continue to decrease, but we've still lost another 44 people in the latest round of reporting. There are 447 new cases in the state. Meanwhile, Attorney General Dana Nessel put out a statement today confirming Governor Whitmer's executive orders are fully enforceable despite the legal challenge and the protests against her stay home order and state of emergency declaration. And there's word this evening that the White House is considering disbanding the coronavirus task force as early as this month. Vice President Mike Pence, who has led the task force since January, said today the task force is looking at what might be the proper time to wind down its work and transfer the responsibilities to other agencies like FEMA. In these past several weeks, we've reported one story after another about the struggle to get the virus under control at care facilities. Right, and families with loved ones in nursing homes, they want answers. So Local 4 Defenders have been flooded with calls and emails from people who worry whether their family members are getting the proper care and protection during this coronavirus pandemic. Local 4 Defender Karen Drew explains why answers are so difficult to come by right now. Cases of COVID-19 are spreading through nursing homes and long-term care facilities all across Metro Detroit. Our senior loved ones getting sick, some not surviving. Tonight, you're hearing from families who worry and wonder about the care they're getting. My biggest fear was that she would contract it. Anthony Messina mourns for his sister Mary. He says she came down with COVID-19 inside the Macomb County nursing home where she was living. Mary was a, always was a fighter. It's pretty hard to fight something when you're in a bed. I haven't got anything except a dead sister. Catherine Maples lost her sister Sharon. She was only 65 years old. She has a lot of questions for her sister's Wayne County nursing home, including how she could have gotten COVID-19. That's my question. The nurses were supposed to be tested temperature wise, cough and everything. Evidently they wasn't tested because the only person was allowed to go in there was the nurse, the seniors and the doctors. Catherine says she didn't learn her sister had coronavirus until after she died. No paperwork, no nothing telling me. Well, this is what happened. Stephen Angelari's mother is in the hospital with COVID-19, transferred from a Macomb County nursing home. Sunday, she was fine. Monday, she found a picture of her, or took a picture of her with a breathing tube, oxygen tube in her nose, sitting up in bed. He too has questions for her nursing home and the spread of COVID-19. Every time I called, do you have any cases or sickness in your nursing home there? Patients, ill. no, everybody's fine. They're all locked down. Everybody's okay. The state now requires nursing homes and long-term care facilities to report current cases of COVID-19. With Wayne County Nursing Homes a hotspot, state and county teams are focused there. They have been very, you know, upfront cooperative, um, you know, wanting our assistance. Nursing home owners tell me they need more tests and supplies. The unions representing workers tell the defenders having enough PPE has been a constant problem. The intervention now gives little solace to these families in mourning. I feel in my heart there was a chance my sister could have gotten better. Some of the families we spoke to say they're talking to attorneys and considering legal action. Local four defenders have learned the governor's executive order grants some immunity to health care facilities from liability for taking necessary steps to protect Michiganders during an emergency, which could impact the ability to sue. Governor's office says it reinforces an existing law. I'm Karen Drew, Local 4 Defenders, back to you. All right, Karen, the state stresses having COVID-19 cases is not an indicator a facility is not following proper procedures, though. Yeah, and some are taking in coronavirus patients from hospitals. You can see the number of COVID-19 cases in nursing homes on our website. Just go to clickondetroit.com and head to the COVID-19 data page. 
Meanwhile, the auto industry is gearing up to try to restart operations later this month, and tonight it is looking more likely than just 24 hours ago even. Business editor Rob Maloney live in Warren with the latest on this, and Rod, the tone has changed markedly. Yeah, markedly, because essentially the UAW. Now, uh, here's the deal. For the last six weeks, the domestic three in the UAW have had a task force to try and figure out how to get open safely and quickly. And so today, Mike Manley, the FCA CEO, who had his quarterly conference call where he had the disappointing news that they've lost about $2 billion. Uh, he said that they're getting ready to start and soon. We expect all plants in North America to restart the week of May 18th, with the exception of Belvedere, which will be back up and running, we think, by June 1st. The signs FCA is nearly ready tonight are already in place outside the Warren truck plant. Disney World style stanchions already installed underneath a giant white tent. It's here employees will line up to get pre-shift health screenings as part of the new safety protocols. It's going to require line workers to arrive about an hour or more early for their shifts. Now this plan has been developed following continuous discussions with the UAW and the governors of the states within which we operate particularly Governor Whitmer from Michigan. The United Auto Workers, who have balked at previous start updates, appeared comfortable with this plan and put out this statement today, quote, we continue to advocate for as much testing as possible at the current time and eventually full testing when available. As for the start date, the companies contractually made that decision and we all knew this day would come. Our UAW focus and role is and will continue to be on health and safety protocols to protect our members. Now, Manley did say that it is a situation where it could change and maybe the 18th won't be the date. They're ready for that, but they're still planning on the 18th. In the meantime, I'm told that part of the reason for all of this and why the 18th is an important date is because it is after the governor's stay at home order here in Michigan would expire. Back to you. And, and Rod, what are uh, GM and Ford, what are they saying about their start updates? Well, neither is committing to the 18th, but we're told that General Motors is going to have its conference call, earning conference call tomorrow, and we may get some guidance there. So we'll have the update for yeah. you tomorrow. Yeah. All right, Rod. Kim? Well, we know there is a lot of information and misinformation out there right now on coronavirus. Our Dr. Frank McGeorge is here with the Trust Index on something you may have heard being recommended using a device that measures your oxygen levels at home to detect COVID-19. Doc? Yeah, Kim, so the most common life-threatening complication of COVID-19 is when it affects your lungs. And since all the oxygen in your body comes from your lungs, checking your oxygen levels with a home pulse oximeter like this one might make sense. But should everyone really have a pulse ox at home? In the hospital, many people are put on a monitor called a pulse oximeter. It works by painlessly shining a special red light through the pad of your finger or even your earlobe and detecting how much can be seen from the other side. The light is absorbed differently depending on how much oxygen is being carried by the hemoglobin in your blood. The monitor gives you a number that's the percentage of hemoglobin with oxygen. For most people, your so-called oxygen saturation is in the high 90s. When you develop lung problems, the amount of oxygen in your blood falls and your oxygen saturation decreases. We noticed early on with COVID-19 that many of the people who would go on to become severe had drops in their pulse ox number below 90%. Pulse oximeter technology has become so common that it's now available in small devices that you can buy for use at home. They look like a fat clothespin that clips to your finger. Most of them will display at least two numbers, your oxygen saturation and your pulse rate. Now the fancier ones will also show a waveform of your pulse. So does it make sense to buy one for use at home? Well, if you have COVID-19 and you're not sick enough to need a hospital admission, it can actually be a good idea to monitor your oxygen saturations at home. If they are consistently decreasing into the lower 90s, that would be a reason to contact your doctor. But if you have not been diagnosed with COVID-19, buying a home pulse ox is of questionable value. You're more likely to have other symptoms that would lead you to get tested before your pulse ox became low. And in a generally healthy person, a low reading is probably an error. So I am giving this a be careful on the trust index. Now, incidentally, the average price is around 30 to $50 for these, but some models can cost a couple hundred dollars. And lastly, even if your numbers are normal, do not get a false sense of security. If you feel short of breath or you have other issues, you should still be seen by a doctor. Back to you. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, Doc.
Detroit City Council approving a new budget today that is full of, as you would expect, cuts more than $380 million worth. Mayor Duggan today praising the council for reaching an agreement and said the biggest setback is likely to be the city's ongoing fight against blight. The biggest loss I think that most people will feel is the demolition program is essentially completely uh, halted. Uh, and, and it's going to have an impact on blight in the neighborhoods. Uh, and I'm hoping that uh, uh, Council Member Ayers uh, will help lead an effort uh, between the mayor and the council to come up with a solution for long-term funding for demolition. But people are noticing it already. Uh, and uh, I am concerned about the blight in the neighborhoods, but it came down to a choice between that or laying off police and firefighters. And we felt like keeping uh, our services intact was priority one, and we need to come back with a solution uh, to finish the job on blight. More of the pain here, though. The mayor also says recreation programs are going to be cut for the summer because there is no way to safely bring the children together anyway. Yeah. Well, it's May the 5th, meaning this is the last day for many to pay rent without penalty, which has become more difficult in the time of COVID-19. And not all landlords, landlords, I should say, are cutting tenants slack. Victor Williams spoke to a family having a rough time to make ends meet. They say their landlord wants them gone. Well, it's the beginning of the month, and once again, so many families are struggling trying to make the rent in on time. We did speak to one person who says he just has no idea when this is going to stop. He's been working. I've been home cooking and cleaning. Marty Parks and his wife Sheila are sharing a similar story with thousands nationwide. It's the fifth of the month and time is running out to pay rent. Landlord was uh, demanding money. Except in this situation, the couple says that they were forced to leave after not being able to pay in the middle of the pandemic. We end up giving them the keys and saying we're going to take our stuff out of there when he uh, threatened to rekey the house and put everything out. Although Marty is still fortunate enough to be working, his hours have been cut, therefore making the task of paying bills on time so much harder. But they know they couldn't have rightfully been evicted. His take was, uh, I'm taking possession, pretty much, and that's how it was. The two have several kids and neither have yet to receive a stimulus check or any form of unemployment. We got three kids and, you know, they basically out here on the street right now just because of this whole situation. Of course, he's hoping for an end to all this madness, but is considering legal action in the future. I would like to see a, uh, at least him help us move in another place or, uh, you know, uh, make another place available for us. Now, we did reach out to the landlord to see if he had any type of comment to make. Unfortunately, at this moment in time, we have yet to hear anything back from him. Victor Williams, Local 4. All right, Victor, we are looking ahead to some less chilly days. Let's hope. Ben? <laughs> you got to squint really hard to see them. They're out there, uh, and we will talk about that. But we've got wind, rain, snow, and record cold all in the next four days. A lot to unpack, and that's next. The cruise line industry has taken a huge financial hit, but now one big cruise line is working to get your business. We have important information coming up in my Help Me Hank report.